So uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, this is Friday. <laughs> will tell us about invariant sets and 3D energy services. Cool. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, always nice to be back in Princeton. So yeah, so let's get started. Um, so I'm going to talk about Hamiltonian flows in R4. So I'm going to fix some smooth function H, R4 to R. And there's an associated vector, vector field, which we call X sub H, which is completely defined by this equation. When you plug it into the symplectic form, you get minus dh. So one nice thing is that the flow of x sub h preserves h. So so in so in particular the what what's the really uh, interesting thing to study is the dynamics of h on or of x of h on level sets of h because x of h preserves restricts to flows on each level set so I'm going to use the notation y to be a to denote a compact regular level set. This, by regular level set, I just mean that y is the pre-image of a regular value of h. Okay, so just to do some drawings, there's lots of different types of level sets that are pretty interesting. So historically, people have been very interested in studying the dynamics of y on convex hypersurfaces. Maybe a little more recently, there's a lot of tools that let you extend a lot of this work or even discover new things in the context of star-shaped hypersurfaces. So these are just hypersurfaces that are transverse with respect to the radial vector field. And both of these, and both of these types of hypersurfaces fall under the umbrella of what are called contact type hypersurfaces, roughly meaning that the dynamics of the Hamiltonian vector field is really the then is really the rate flow of some contact form on on the hypersurface. And it's apparently, well, I was talking to Belant about this like 30 minutes ago. Um, it's not entirely clear whether you can have contact type hypersurfaces in R4 that are not maybe three spheres. Yes. But there's a lot of other. I mean, uh, globally, uh, I mean, the, the, oh, yeah. you could have something nearby. I mean, that's there's a transversal vector field, uh, which is conforming nearby, or it could be extend and come from a global vector field, which is true in these two cases. Uh, yeah, I just mean, I, I, I guess I mean, maybe I mean contact type, maybe by contact type, I mean having a low, local uh, local vector field. Yeah, yes. yeah. So I mean, yeah, really, I think the topology. So the, the topology will be maybe different. Yeah, yeah. Really, I, I, yeah. Mainly, what I so wanted to say is that I have no idea what the gap between these two is. Yeah. So yeah. if it's a sphere-like uh, contact type locally, then it looks after change of coordinates like this. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's Yasha, the nucleus of tight. Yeah, so, yeah, but so there's also a lot of non-contact type hypersurfaces. 
I mean, I think one example, which I learned from either Joel or Helmut, is you take two of these spheres, and then you dig a little tunnel in between them. So this is not contact type. So that example actually is, I think, in large times, we already states a one state Oh, really? I see. It's good to know. Yeah, so the, the reason that is that this is not contact type is basically because the uh, periodic orbits will have different uh, different actions of different signs. Okay. So there's a there's quite a lot known about the dynamics by now about the dynamics of 3D contact type hypersurfaces. I think I'll try and write there's there's way too many names. I'll try and write a good chunk of them. So So, for example, it's known that any contact type hypersurface has at least two uh, simple periodic orbits. So, this is a pretty long history. I think Rabinowitz in the convex case. Rabinowitz uh, was so short. Okay, a star shaped. Okay. I mean, it was a star shaped, and at the same time, a Weinstein proof for, for convex. Ah, oh, okay. I knew I would get it wrong somewhere. I guess I got it wrong right at the start. But <laughs> read the floor book at some point. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So Rabinowitz, uh, yeah, Rabinowitz, Weinstein. Um, Turbo had a did the turbo improve? Yeah, Vita Vita Bo yeah. was the first to actually prove the Weinstein conjecture in R2N for R2N. Right. Okay. Yeah, the turbo, yeah, the Turbo 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 Yeah, then well now we're getting into areas I know, then Hofer for general at whenever it's S3 or over twisted or has or has non trivial pi 2. Tobs or general contact through manifolds. And then when, when the hypersurface is star shaped and slash or non degenerate, uh, then you have two or infinitely many periodic orbits. So this, this is, uh, this is the combination of a series of works starting with Wilfred Sasky Zender. Um, Christopher Gardner. Uh, Hutchings, Homer Leano. Uh, I'm missing a reference up here. These are all one periodic orbit. And then I should add Christopher Gardner. Hutchings. So they they improved to uh, they they improved to two periodic orbits, and now that I wrote down Dan's name once, I can start abbreviating. So C G H Hutchings. Oh. Humboliano. And then um yeah, and then and then very so Hofer Wasowski Zander proved this tour infinity 
for star shaped hypersurfaces with which satisfied a Kupka smale condition. And, and uh, they, they proved this for any non degenerate star shaped hypersurface. Um, uh, then for any non-degenerate hypersurface, star shaped or not. And then finally, and then recent, very recently, Christopher Gardner, Brignavit, uh, Hutchings, and Liu proved it for any star-shaped hypersurfaces, and more more generally for any uh, any torsion three D contact forming. So, right, and then maybe the maybe the last um, result I want to mention in the contact case is that C infinite generically, you have either dense or you have dense slash equal distributed. Periodics. So this is very okay. All right. So I, there's a lot, a lot known in the contact type case, and but in the non-contact type case, for ex examples like these, there's comparatively little. Known. So this, I'm going to. Um, well, there's more is known, but I'm going to be extremely biased and write down one recent, very, very interesting result. So this is by Fishhofer. This is 2018. So it appeared in 23. I was about to mention, yeah. Oh, sorry. The, 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 the preprint was in 18, and it appeared in the annals in 23. So it took, I started grad school in 2018 and I finished in 23. So it took me <laughs> my entire career or something yeah, the, for this paper to be refereed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they wanted me as an analyst editor beforehand, before that, uh, but uh, they couldn't do that because they wanted to make a decision on this. Oh, case. well, I see. And, <laughs> saved me for a while. So, but, so that's not all positive, uh, not all negative. So. <laughs> Great, great. Yeah. So, so this theorem, you know, is about Hamiltonians on R4 and why any, any compact regular level set. And it says that there, there exists some proper proper XH invariant closed subset lambda in or maybe I'll use the notation C sitting inside. Okay. So so in the contact type case, there's a lot of results about periodic orbits. Well, in this case, we we've, we've just detected some proper invariant subset, and so I should put this result in the proper context, which is that outside of the contact type case, it's it's entirely possible that you might not have any periodic orbits at all. So there's this um, so there's this very nice example by Ginsburg and Borel. Um, Which says that there exists there exists some C two H and some Y with no periodicals. Right. 
Yeah, so, yeah, so, and just to, and, and I think this example maybe can be upgraded to a C2 plus alpha Hamiltonian. Yeah, that is what they say. Uh, actually, all methods can also be, so we, we work with smooth, but we can go down to this as well. So. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, the, so for the, for the talk, I'm usually going to be assuming the Hamiltonian is smooth because eventually I'm going to talk about holomorphic curves. But generally, the holomorphic curve formalism works at, okay if you're in, say, if you're working with, say, C2 plus alpha Hamiltonians. Right. Right. So this theorem is kind of discovering something totally new. It's discovering some invariant, proper invariant set, even when there might not be any periodic orbits and outside the contact type case. What is the proper subset? Uh, something which is just not all of Y, I guess. And also what is Ah, proper. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that this, I'm saying proper with respect to Y, perhaps. Yeah, it would be interesting to see if there's a smooth counter example, but uh, right. unfortunately, there's not so much room in the dimension three. Right. Yeah. Oh, I see. So this uh, Ginsburg Gurel examples are okay. There are no smooth. There are no smooth counter example. However, in all higher dimensions, for R six and up, there you have smooth examples which don't have periodic components. So. So the construction here is you know, the, the something iteratively and just depending on the smooth. But but it's but it's, it is still open. But there is a smooth. It, it, it is an open question if a, if there exists a smooth counter example, a, a smooth a regular energy a compact regular energy cells without regular bounds. Yeah. So that's a long-standing problem. Yeah, to give yeah to give some perspective, I think the way this construction works very roughly is that they break up a break up periodic orbits by inserting one of these dendro torus toruses two tori, which so they put some aperiodic two torus in in the middle of a periodic orbit, and such a thing doesn't exist in in uh, this high high regularity. Or you can't get a Hamiltonian to do it and to do something like this in high regularity. Okay, so given this theorem, so there's some you might so you might ask, you know, are one philosophical question is what is the given the Ginsburg Girl example is what is kind of the analog of periodic orbit outside the contact type setting? Like, what's the right thing to look for? And this result seems to indicate maybe the right thing to look for or the thing we have the best chance of finding are proper compact invariant sets. So we might think about improving this result. Maybe like similarly to how Christopher Gardner and Hutchings improved the Weinstein conjecture, we could find two of them, two proper invariant sets. Maybe we could find infinitely many. Maybe we could find dense invariant sets. So the main theorem that I wanna talk about is that you can basically do all of the above. <coughs> but is it similar, like, is it like, is there a gap between two and infinity? Like a uh, junior gap, like once you find the second, there is no third one, like? Uh, oh, okay, yeah. So, it's H R core to R and Y a compact regular level set. Then there exists an infinite family of pairwise distinct. Proper compact invariant sets in Y with the uh, dense union in Y. Okay, 
So I wasn't trying to avoid your question. Uh, what I what I meant to say was, there's no two or infinity. There's just infinitely many. Yeah, because here you could, of course, if you well, the perfect periodic orbits plus. If you have only two, then how it doesn't look like it. if you have this pseudo rotation ellipsoid. Yeah. Uh, then uh, you, you can also find a close in one subset. Uh, yeah, yeah. This 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 has been relatively well understood, pretty much well understood actually in in this in low dimensions since Lacalvez and Yokos. Um, it, yeah. So in this case, you do have all these compact invariant sets, this infinite family with dense union. But, well, for example, I said here, I asserted that the family is pairwise distinct, not pairwise disjoint. So in the, in this Cadoc example, you only have three ergodic invariant measures, which are maybe two periodic orbits and the volume measure. And any invariant set carries an ergodic measure. So if I had four invariant sets, with the disjoint supports, they would each carry a different ergodic measure, which is impossible. So, so in general, you can get pairwise distinct invariant sets, but not necessarily pairwise okay, so disjoint. Two periodic orbits and then yeah. pairs, uh, as a single other unit. Yeah, yeah, it is a little unfortunate that the words distinct and disjoint are so similar. So we have to make this uh, footnote. Yeah, so most people. <laughs> It's, you might think it's as yeah. it's, it's ideal. But the lawyers. <laughs> the lawyers. The lawyers. The lawyers. The lawyers. The lawyers. Okay. Yeah. So, d does anybody have any more questions? I was going to give a few a few remarks on on this, which will probably overlap with. <laughs> natural questions. Yeah, the, the Ginsburg Borel example. Uh, can you can it contradict uh, the theorem? I mean, in, in non smooth case, non smooth version of the theorem? Or either one? Either uh, one fish hopper. Well, the way the Ginsburg Gorel example works is that they replace a periodic orbit with some proper invariant set, basically. I see. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, so it's. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, perhaps you could ask if there's some C2 Hamiltonian for which the flow is minimal, uh, you know, has no proper invariant sets. I, this seems quite unlikely, I, just given, given this result. I guess, yeah, I mean, for example, I, this, this will hold when H is C2 plus alpha. So let me give some remarks. More common, maybe. Oh, yeah. If you consider not the pseudo rotation case, but just an irrational ellipse, right? So the return maps now a rotation. I guess in that case, you can find them to be disjoint, right? You find like a bunch of cylinders. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's right. In this case, you just have a bunch of invariant tori. Yeah, exactly. What did you say about minimal invariant sets? So the the Cadoc example also gives pretty strong restrictions. Um, the, by because of the Cadoc example, I think um, you well there are there are example the Cad in the Cadoc example there's exactly two two minimal sets, mm -hmm. just which is just the two periodic orbits. So. There's an upper bound of two yeah. in general, and, but even in even in this statement, it does not directly imply that um, there's more than one minimal set. All you know in general is that any invariant set contains a minimal set, yeah. but it it doesn't necessarily decompose into minimal sets. And so yeah, this is one reason maybe people like to look at invariant measures instead of invariant sets because. Yeah. In that case, you have the ergodic decomposition. Yeah. So maybe a little, these objects are a little more well behaved. Okay. 
So I think I'll make some some additional comments. Yeah. So yeah. So just the. Uh, So, question, do you think, so you use that uh, you put this with ECH, do you believe that one can construct something in, in the in R cross Y, some kind of foliation by holomorphic stuff? So, or this this one is doesn't use ECH, just to grow my body theory. Uh, just like but, um, yeah, but I guess, well, I mean, locally, the, the floor looks like every other, you know? So I wonder if it's possible to to get something reasonable, transversal to the floor, which has, say, a terrible boundary lying in some of the, in some particular invariant subsets. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that'll, that'll be very interesting. I mean, that's one thing to, that's definitely one thing to look at. One thing I did not mention here, in the contact type cases, there's a lot of now a lot of known results about Birkhoff sections. Um, perhaps in this case, you could try finding using holomorphic curves to finding kind of a weak version of a Birkhoff section, which is you know in a transverse surface inside the complement of some invariant set, or or, or you know which is properly embedded in the complement of some invariant set, so it has you know some maybe some awful boundary. But the boundary is still invariant. Yeah, but um, I I don't have any expectations. I guess one way or the other. Then uh, it's, it's a natural this, question. This result would uh, so apply to the double to the three, three body problem. Yeah? So double cover of the restricted circular three body problem. I think where you have uh, when you have too low energy, you either uh, close to one of the primaries. And if you're a little bit larger, you can actually go from one to the other, but mm -hmm. you cannot go to infinity. And then, so I talked with Bert Bruno, so, so close, it, it could be that close invariant subsets actually would have nice properties. So if, if they mm -hmm. are useful properties. I see. So if, if, for example, the Q coordinate is near a primary and so on, it doesn't have to be periodic. It's just that you want stuff to stay there. And uh -huh. then, when you want to get there, you want to sort of aim with the stuff, then it comes and it just stays for a while near a closed invariant subset when it comes from the earth. And so, or you have to, maybe you even have to use the sun also. But, but uh, I think that might actually have applications, uh, interesting closed invariant subsets. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, I guess in, yeah, in, I, 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 I supposed that these results on Hamiltonians on R4 might apply to non-contact type levels of the three body problem, but it was unclear how, to me, how interesting that would be. <laughs> yeah, so I, may, I mentioned uh, this was our term, so let's see. So, now, yeah, so just some, I guess we've already talked about some remarks that I wanted to make. So I'll just give maybe like two more that we haven't addressed yet. So just the first remark is that the theorem is false if the invariant sets are required to be periodic limits. So we, we have this infinite family of invariant sets with a dense union in Y. If they were all required to be periodic orbits, then the theorem would be asserting that periodic orbits are always dense in Y. And you can easily construct counterexamples to this statement, some of which we've already mentioned, like ellipsoids or the Caddock example, which in fact only have finitely many periodic orbits. Right. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention is um, the 
So in a recent preprint with Dan, we proved some slightly stronger statements in a different setting. So these are for torsion 3D contact forms. and uh, say Hamiltonian surface diffeomorphisms. Right, so I just wanted to mention that this kind of, this kind of statement, this dense existence of compact invariant sets holds more, a, lot, a lot more broadly in, at least in low dimensional symplectic dynamics. Yeah, kind of, the this case is maybe a little bit uh, a little bit different because here we're more in the contact type setting. So we have tools like ECH and ECH and so on, which are not really available for non-contact type hypersurfaces. <laughs> so yeah, so to so to kind of motivate the, the proof of this theorem, I want to I want to talk about how you find periodic orbits in the contact type case, and maybe and maybe a, a very a, you know my own biased view of how Fish and Hover find their invariant set in in, in their uh, 2018 paper or preprint. Open Teddy Fish will turn the pages to find one. So, all right, so in the, so maybe I'm going to do some, do some artwork. So maybe I'll move over here. So, so, the, so here's kind of the modern proof on how to find a periodic orbit for a contact type hypersurface in R4. Okay, so first you take Y and you look at, and you compactify R4 to look at it as a hypersurface in CP2. And maybe here's the CP1 at infinity, okay? And CP2 has a lot of holomorphic curves. In, in particular, it has, through any two points, you can find a holomorphic sphere. So you can take some holomorphic sphere, which passes through, which kind of crosses the hypersurface Y. Okay. And then you have these hypersurfaces for, you know, or sorry, you have these spheres for any tame, almost complex structure, not just the standard one. So you can deform the, comp the almost complex structure and stretch the neck around this hypersurface Y. Okay, so now our little sphere looks like this. Okay, and then since you're in the contact type case, you can apply this SFT compactness theorem. And you can show that this holomorphic sphere actually degenerates into some kind of uh, whatever, some kind of holomorphic building. And actually, these breakings in the middle are all closed, closed variable bits. So, so now, so that's a contact type case. Now let me explain Fischhofer. Again, from my viewpoint, what I'm gonna write is slightly, diff is slightly different from the way they set things up. So if it looks fishy, that's entirely my fault. Okay. 
So you can start in the same way. Now you have a non-contact type vector surface and you look at your modulus space of homomorphic spheres. But now, now when you stretch the neck, because it's not contact type, uh, you don't have very good control on what happens to the curve inside the neck. So in fact, it kind of goes very crazy. It looks like this. Okay, so the SFT compactus theorem will not will not apply because you lack some kind of required energy bounds. So what's done instead is you can show that you still have some kind of control, at least near the bottom of the neck. So you can pick controlled pieces of curve near the bottom of the neck that get longer and longer as you stretch the neck. And then there's some like weaker form of Gromov compactness you can apply, it, which is which is uh, called exhaustive Gromov compactness. And this, this was proved by, this theorem itself was, you know, dreamed up by Fish and Hofer. Right. And, and you get some kind of fullomorphic curve in, say, the symplectization over Y. And the, this curve, you know, generally doesn't have, is not like a, finite energy curve, but they can show that the end is a proper, proper invariant set. Okay. All right, so, so these two pictures in mind, I want to, you know, I guess give the Two, the two ideas that go into producing, instead of just one invariant set, pr producing infinitely many. All right, so I think, the first one, at least, will sound pretty reasonable. So, and that is to use the uh, higher, higher degree moduli spaces. You know, in both cases, you're just using here. You're just using the moduli space of spheres in the CP two, but you have, you have, you know pretty good moduli spaces of degree D curves in CP2 for any D. So hopefully these carry some additional dynamical information when you stretch the link. Okay. Then the second idea is, well, in this case, you're, in this case, you're only, you're recovering information from, well, due to the fact that SFT compactness fails, you're only recovering information really from part of the neck. There's kind of a, maybe there's a lot of data in there, which is getting thrown away and that we could try taking a closer look at. So the way that we take a closer look at it is, well, I'm going to summarize it as we use a, 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 a much weaker, you know, compactification. which uh, extracts information from the whole net. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to elaborate on one and two in a sec, but does anybody have any questions so far, at least about this setup? Sorry, really very naive. I mean, the cartoon picture that this suggests in the fish offer, why, why they don't also look at the upper part of the neck for the piece of sand? Oh, Doesn't that good. also give a proper no, Yeah, yeah. You, you could. So then they, they have at least two proper invariants? Uh, you could just get the same thing. But they don't have to be. Yeah, yeah. It's hard. It's it's a little hard to tell if you get the same thing or you yes. get two two different ones. Yeah. Yeah, somehow, 
Yeah, somehow you get a lot of mileage from looking at the entire neck. So, all right, so let me, so let me summarize the, all right, so I guess what I'll do is I'll su summarize the main properties of the higher degree moduli spaces, and then I'll, you know, give a definition of this compactification, and then I'll talk about some of its structural properties, which go into, uh, which go into uh, proving this. So, it, all right, so degree D modulus space. So for any TAM J, there exists a stable J homomorphic map or J homomorphic curve. U and CP2, which has a bunch of has a bunch of properties that we kind of and we kind of make use of all of them. So the first the first one is that this curve is degree D, namely its homology class is D times the the divisor at infinity. The second property is that the is that the uh, arithmetic genus of this of the domain is approximately d squared. And then the third property is that we can can fix approximately d squared point constraints. On you. So, more precisely, given any set of about d squared points, we can find a degree d curve with genus d about d squared, which passes through them. So, those are the moduli spaces that we'll use. Okay. And then, yeah, so now, now, I'll now I'll define the compactification. This definition is a little more involved. It kind of relies on some addition uh, on some prior notation from you know the next stretching setup. So I'll go over that. So so let's start with I'll start with CP two. So this is still genus zero curves. Uh, no, no, curves are very high genus. Oh, very high genus. Yeah, quite the opposite. All right, so I'm going to fix some additional data. So I'm going to fix some finite set of points P inside Y. And I'm going to fix some, some K greater than one, and also some D, which is much greater than one. Okay, and and for e for each choice of this data, I'm going to have some curve u d d comma k, and the curve is going to look like this. So, in in my manifold, I'm going to have a neck of length about two k. So k, k is the length of the neck, and then and then d is the degree of the curve. So I'm going to pick a bunch of point constraints inside the neck, which are basically copies of approximately d squared copies of p. So I'm going to take kind of equally spaced level sets, d, d squared equally spaced level sets inside the neck and put a copy of P in each level set. Uh, and then I'm going to have my curve pass, pass through all of these. So that's the basic neck stretching setup. And now 
I will give a definition. Hmm. So I'm going to define this thing that I call the stretched limit set. And it's going to be denoted by X sub D. And it's a space consisting of, and, and it's a space consisting of pairs, which I'll write as lambda and S with the following properties. So lambda here is a closed subset of minus one, one cross Y. And S here is just some real number in minus one. Okay. So the stretch limit set is going to be the set of all pairs like this, which satisfy so the property. What is it for, uh, behind lambda? What is that for kind of letter? S? Yeah, yeah. And S is what? It's a real number between oh, minus one and one. Yeah. Yeah, the definition is a little long, so I'm slowly getting into it. So, so what we want is that there exists a sequence of numbers S sub K in minus KK, such that, well, first we have K inverse S sub K converges to S, and also, a subsequence of slices. So, so these S sub K, so you know, S sub K def define a sequence of slices. So this is U, we take the image U D of K, C D of K, we intersect it with S K minus one, S K plus one cross Y, and then we shift it down by a sub k. And the end result is that we get some closed subset inside minus one, one cross y. Okay. And we want a subsequence of these slices to converge to lambda in the house drift in the house drift ball. So uh, the different S levels, it would be just the same dynamics, which you have when you say invariant subset. Of, you mean um, with respect to the vector field you have on Y? So right now, these are just closed subsets. They're not, oh, no, not when invariant. you say invariant subset, what do you mean by invariant with respect to what? Just to the flow on Y? Yeah, yeah, the and, flow then, uh, and then it keeps the first call and fix and just yeah have, have a family of the same flow on different levels. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. For for technical reasons, it's a little easier to work with these kind of thickened slices instead of just slicing the curves directly. Yeah, because so, then you get a curve, then you can, have, can do some uh, some compactness. Or yeah, whatever. yeah. So the point is that. We're just tracking the Hausdorff limits of all the slices of this sequence of stretching curves. That's the lambda. And then S is just a device to track their vertical position. It's, yeah, it just turns out to be useful for bookkeeping. So, sorry, Hill, what is the notation that you wrote there? I missed it. So is it? Yeah, the board is a little busy. Sorry. Um, which which so, one do you have? Subsequence of slices, and then what does it say after that? So, yeah, so this line is, yeah. Uh, yeah, just defining the slices. And then it's saying that uh, some subsequence of them converge to this lambda in the Hausdorff topology. So the slice would be if you cut it SK, but he thickens it, so SK minus one, SK plus one, because then you have a pseudomorphic curve li living within that second set. Uh, okay. Yeah, sorry, does that answer your question or is there? Kind of, I mean, I'm just confused about what it says, but it's okay. I mean, I can ask later. It's okay. okay. All right, cool. I, I can understand what's written. 
In the beginning of the row before last. In the row before last. Yeah, no. Go down, 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 down. Up one. Uh -huh. Yeah. Beginning of that. What is yeah. That? Shifted by SK. So. Oh, okay. oh, yeah. 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 By SK, yeah. yeah, this is mainly for convene, you know, to be on the ball with my definitions. I mean, yeah, you're taking these slices of width two of height two of your holomorphic curve, but you want to consider them just as subsets of minus one, one cross y. So you want to yes. shift them down. Yeah, that, that was my question too. Thanks. Oh, okay. All right. Got it. So, I guess to so just so all right. So what I'm going to do is um, list several, you know, kind of structural properties of this stretched limit set. I mean, roughly speaking, you know, you can find you can find when you take d very large, you can find lots of s. For which this this uh, lambda is kind of nearly an invariant set. It's very close to being an invariant set. Right, so let me give a more precise statement. So so there has to be uh, so when you when you increase the d, so the symplectic area of, of the curve goes up, and then I guess there should be plenty of uh, there should be enough slices where you can control some energy. Is that? Yeah. So yeah. So you can control the energy. You can control the topology of the slice too. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, yeah, so if you have curves with very low action, they should be nearly invariant. Mm -hmm. But I will, yeah, I will write this down a little more formally. Structure. All right. So there's kind of three structural properties which are afforded. So the first one is that for approximately d squared levels s, there there is uh, there exists some. I should say there exists some lambda s xd such that zero cross p lies inside lambda. So if you remember, I fixed a bunch of point constraints. You know, I put copies of p at about d squared levels. Uh, this structural property a is just a reflection of this fact. Second structural property is maybe a little more interesting. And it says for for almost every every S the and pair every pair of lambda S XD is such that lambda is equal to Minus one one across C, where so so it turns out that for most levels S, all of these lambdas are actually going to be cylinders over proper compact invariant sets. And before I explain this, I'll just state property C, which is a little more quantitative. Um, which says that for all but little o of d squared s, if lambda s in xd is such that uh, lambda is an epsilon almost cylinder. Where here, epsilon goes to zero as g goes to infinity. All right. So, what I'm saying here is that for almost every level set, you can find a proper compact invariant set. 
And then you have a more quantitative version of this, which says that for almost all but some well controlled set of levels, um, the, the lambda is almost a, is like epsilon close to a cylinder over an invariant set, or epsilon gets closer to zero as d goes to infinity. Okay. So, yeah, so I'll, I'll explain. So, really, B and C are where all the analysis is in the proof of the theorem. Um, and Yeah, and then a, a, after you establish these structural properties, then there's some interesting topological arguments which get get you to the theorem. But let me just really quickly explain how, like the how C and D work or C and B work. So, so, so the point behind C is that for all but O of D squared S, the slices have O of little O of one action. This is basically or little O of one action and big O of one uh, Euler characteristic. So this this kind of this kind of makes sense. I mean, if you chop up your curve into d squared pieces, then since the genus is d squared, you know most of these most of the most of the pieces of your curve will have o of one o of one genus or o of one other characteristic. Similarly, if you chop up your curve into d squared pieces. Then most of then most of the pieces will have O of D inverse energy or action. Okay. So yeah, so with with this in, you have to be kind of careful with how you actually work out the details, but that's the that's the heuristic. And then yeah, and then my recent paper with Dan. We have this analytic result, which says that low action plus bounded Euler characteristic implies that the that the slice is nearly invariant. Right. So, yeah, so roughly speaking, if you have some compact curve with bounded topology and sufficiently low action, then it'll look almost like a cylinder over an invariant set. That's, that's kind of the point here. And then, and, and, and so we, we kind of strongly use the prop, these properties that are down for the degree demoduli space to ensure that most of the slices have this property. Actually, like, you know, for, be kind of all but a little o of d squared of the levels have, have this property. Okay, and then to explain B, well, I mean, the first part of B is, the first part of B is essentially kind of a non-quantitative version of this. I mean, you can show that for almost all, all S, you can, your slices completely run out of action. They don't just have little o one of action, they just have action going to zero. So your slices will converge to a cylinder over an invariant set for almost every S. And then to get the properness, uh, we, we, we adapt this uh, this intersection theoretic argument by Fish and Hofer. So, so I'm, so it is pretty much two o'clock. So I'll just try and pass from this kind of very technical structural result to 
maybe one sentence about how you could possibly extract lots of invariant sets. So, all right, so maybe sentence number one is, you know, from X sub D, you extract some large family of uh, nearly invariant, nearly invariant sets. And you know that one of them is proper and one contains this, this point constraints P. Okay. And then the and then the second the second sentence is that you basically take D to infinity to get a large family. of invariant sets. So what I mean by this is, you know, in point one, you extract this large family of nearly invariant sets where your error goes to zero as D goes to infinity. So then you can take D to infinity and look at the accumulation points of each of, of, of these families as D goes to infinity. And you, then you get some large family of invariant sets. And then there's some, you know, topological arguments which use really use all of A, B, and C essentially to get to the desired conclusion. Uh, but since we're out of time, all I can say is that eventually we get there. All right, thank you for listening. Question. Oh, good. Well, good luck. Yeah, sorry. Not so obvious, maybe, but it's. Uh, Fischhofer invariant set is one of them you find? That's, that's kind that's of the that. invariant set you extract in B, basically. Uh -huh. So, yeah, so the Fischhofer approach actually, I think it, it basically works to get an invariant, like one invariant set, proper invariant set from each high dimensional moduli space. Uh -huh. uh, a priori, it's hard to tell if they're the same one or not. So, um, and so the analysis in, in in some sense, is what we do. Or what? Yeah, it's some combination of what you guys do plus uh, whatever and, elaborations and, me and Dan make. Uh, yeah, it. so so you take you produce more and more of those situations which we consider, but because of taking this. Yeah. Process. So when I look at this construction here, you could in, in, induce uh, some parameter, namely the modification of the energy surface. Slide modification, yeah. So, so you so you you study one energy surface. Now take a parameter space which modifies the energy surface, and for each of them simultaneously, we can make such type of arguments. So then, uh, with with Joel, we had that paper where we get the almost existence result out of that. Yeah. Path. So I wonder if you could actually by then. In the slices, or take longer slices, show that they contain sub-slices, we actually get a periodic orbit. Oh, so and then maybe because you do all this stuff, you get many of the periodic orbits. And I wonder if you cannot do uh, with this the closing. Then. Yeah. So I have a theorem along these lines that you know these kinds of ideas work for. Um, I mean, yeah, you can do this adiabatic limit construction that you and Joel cooked up to these higher degree moduli spaces. Yeah, yeah. so could you can, I, like uh, you, you have these fixed slices, but you could talk le longer slices, presumably. Yeah. And then you show that in, within such a slice, certain things happen. Namely, if you run too much of energy, then there, there maybe has to be some periodic orbit or not. Yeah. yeah. So you can you can use these kinds of ideas to show, for example, if you have a C infinity generic Hamiltonian, then almost every level set contains infinitely many orbits. 
Not not as good as debts, but uh, you can get okay, it. So, yeah. so, okay, so okay, so you're saying? Can you say again? Sorry. Uh, so, um, yeah. So I think using these kind of arguments, you can show eventually that if you have a C infinity generic Hamiltonian R four, then for almost every compact regular energy surface, uh, you have infinitely many distinct periodic orbits but you need so, a Hamiltonian so, so you mean for G, uh, c infinity in the bare sense what you say yeah yeah so it's a um, bare generic yeah, so, so i wonder now if, if if one looks at an energy surface and has a clever idea in which directions one should deform it yeah you know, like uh, take an take an energy surface and introduce first a large number of parameters and if you tune the parameters, it deforms in certain ways. But I don't know how. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm not sure. So a, a, a good way so that, that you actually get also localization of things. Because when you just say generic, okay, so they could clump all at, at a spot. Oh yeah. But definitely. but if 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 you study your machinery and what the holomorphic curves coming in, that maybe you can actually ex, ex, introduce explicit deformation parameters of your surface, which are in tune with the construction which you do, and then maybe you can control with that here. Yeah. Uh, no, that was so heavy. It was uh, I, I, I don't have anything so, so optimistic to stay on this matter. Well, you don't have to yeah. say anything now. I mean, you know, <laughs> next week. <laughs> I was, was, was kind of happy with the infinitely many ones. No, no, so, that's, <laughs> no, no, that's very good. But, uh, uh, but I think, <laughs> yeah. Whenever, I, I whenever I see a lot of potential of making that argument even more complicated, and you get more out of it. Yeah, yeah. Whenever I'm done being happy, I guess I will. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question too. I mean, maybe it's a bit tangential, but since Helmut talked about the three-body problem, say I wanted to use these ideas in that context. So now I look at. Jacobi constant, which is higher than the first critical value, right? So the level set is now RP3, connect, connect sum with RP3, and I have this non-contact sort of dynamics there. I guess I would have to start finding some sort of compactification with a lot of, uh, with very rich gram of theory, theory, um, and, and maybe try to run this arguments, right? Is that how this would go? So it's, in this case, is this a hypersurface in R four or? Well, not on the nose, right? Oh, okay, um, I'm I'm not familiar with the setup at all. I guess, but uh, I guess in terms of useful stuff, I could say. I mean, I think I I think you can probably replace R four in these statements with like the cotangent bundle of the tor two torus or the cotangent bundle of S two. Okay. Um, actually, even cotangent bundles of higher genus surfaces, I'm not so sure. I mean, maybe one could go to the double cover sort of S3, but then you have this connected sum, so I'm not sure how, how this would work. Can't you see it as like the unit this bundle of S2? Um, yes. Oh, yeah, I was talking, yeah, I was talking about the, yeah, the ambient manifold, I guess, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I'm I think I'm too confused about the setup. Okay, maybe we can talk later. Is that Helmut how yeah, you were yeah. thinking about it? I guess. Uh, uh sorry. What are you, what are you, I didn't catch that last sentence. Maybe for Helmut, is, is that how how you, how you were thinking about trying to use this stuff? Well, I. It looks to me that the three body, the, the restricted circular three body, isn't too far away from the. Or four. Okay. And then, uh, how uh, is it meanwhile known that if you go about that, uh, uh, if the energy is large enough that it's still a uh, contact time? Is it known? It's known that it's not, that, you, that at some point you lose the. Uh, ah, okay, so then uh, you would really use something like this. Yeah, that's what I would expect. Yeah, okay. 
Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, in this business of space travel and so on, I think uh, invariant subsets are good. That's very cool. So, and if you, you don't get, like them, so you can use fewer. So. Instead of invariant sets, you can get like finer things like uh, foliation cycles. Uh, depend. Uh, actually, getting foliation cycles is a little easier or something. Um, I mean, instead of instead of taking Hausdorff limits of these slices, what you could do is you can take this slice of holomorphic curve, you consider it as a two-dimensional current, you divide it by its mass, then you take a weak limit. And if the at whatever action action divided by the area of the curve goes to zero, then you'll recover a cylinder over some foliation cycle. So, um, yeah. So, but um, um, somehow the I mean, I guess we were talking about this Caddock example, which says that you know you can have. I, I, you can't hope for producing, you know, like genuinely, infinitely many genuinely distinct foliation cycles or erg ergodic measures, just because there's examples with only three ergodic measures. So somehow you, you have these situations where the measures are not that interesting, but the invariant sets are. Maybe there are other situations with the reverse. So you, you can play around with both of them, but. So another question. So if, if you now have an energy surface in R4, which precisely has, has two periodic orbits, so mm -hmm. when we know Maslow index action and so on, and then we pretend it could possibly be a candidate for an ellipsoid when we have diaphanta, some diaphanta condition. Now, okay. if, if you apply this kind of machinery, and you know, when John I proved the almost existence result and so on. So then I think there should be, you cannot produce more periodic orbits than the two you already have. That gives you certain certain kind of growth and certain energies and so on, which I think, but we control, we showed something is small enough and out of this we concluded that there are periodic orbits. So if you know there are any and you stay away from the ones which you know, then there are certain growth conditions of, 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 of this energy quantities. So I wonder now um, if, if perhaps, if one uses this, one, one, one gets really a lot of rigidity out of this because there aren't other periodic orbits. And then if one concludes, for example, then maybe one can show that there can't be a dense orbit uh, <laughs> and so on, but by just systematically doing this kind of stuff, yeah? You don't know where it is. And, dense orbit. Huh? I think there can be a dense orbit. No, no, it not in the Diophanta. Uh, ah. Presumably not in the Diophanta yeah. case, where, the, where the, basically Michel Hermann's conjecture in that context would be, it should be symplectomorphic to an ellipse. Yeah, yeah, okay. Huh? So, so I wonder, because you get a lot of information out of this, yeah? just systematically doing this, you can't produce periodic orbits that gives you certain estimates, then maybe the diaphantine conditions which you have actually give you certain growth of things locally and so on and so on and so on. And then maybe you can exclude a lot of, of, of dynamical features which in the counter example to, I mean, when you have not the diaphantine condition. Yeah, I think in general, you always get some family of, in this situation, you get some family of invariant sets, which interpolate between the two orbits, like they fit into some connected family of invariant sets. The, uh, yeah, one would hope that once you have a Diophantine condition, you have a lot more rigidity on what this family is. Like, How much, you, you were talking about the contact case, or? Are we talking about that? Are you assuming contact manipulation? No, 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 just just take uh, yeah, uh, take an ellipsoid. Maybe one can even does one know if it's two periodic orbits? Maybe it has to be contact. I don't know. If well, so it's I diffeomorphic think it's, to it is spherical, diffeomorphic yeah. to a sphere. It has two periodic orbits. Uh, the mass of index uh, called it same index. Uh, you have some yeah. fun time condition. Mm -hmm. So, so it's the one which you sort of need not to have immediately a contact. Yeah. 
And, and then playing around with the almost existence result for periodic orbits, uh, th then these numbers, ha I think, have to appear there in some growth. And so you get more and more control about these pieces, which then uh, uh, say there's not bad, uh, I don't know, so it, it gives us some uh, constraints. Okay. Yeah. I kind of see what you're getting at. Hmm. I think it would be a shot because this is so far advanced from the other methods people have by starting say uh, for the disc foliating from the outside and so on and here this holomorphic stuff can actually connect different things yeah that's yeah. different things it relates them but it's connecting and action quotients of these numbers and so on and so on this is what the other guys don't have so therefore they start foliating from the boundary and then they get stuck but but presumably the reason that they get stuck would would imply that there has to be some other uh, dynamical phenomenon which they exclude up there. But I think for that you need you need this more theoretic type stuff which we get from this. Here. Yeah, we relate beyond periodic orbits. We relate different dynamical features. And and, and this stuff which you consider this is something like a Morse flow line of some sort. Yeah, and then you deform this and uh, and so on. And, and that that propagates really local content all over the place so so i i would i would try to do that if i were, were you and then see where you run against the wall yeah yeah and then maybe some other good stuff so yeah yeah i think i was going to look at whether you can recover the local result say these circles near the boundary yeah that's then good. if you can recover the local result maybe you feel good enough to try it yeah i mean you don't have to go the full, yeah. full distance full distance yeah uh, yeah. No, no, good. Uh, yeah. To start to start something, I have to either be sufficiently happy or sufficiently unhappy. Oh, well. <laughs> so maybe you said it. So this invariant subsets. Uh, so they are, I assume they are what codimension two. Uh, it's hard to. It's kind of hard to say because just because the class of systems you consider is so wide, I feel like you know any time I've thought about a possible state descriptive statement for the invariant sets. I can open up this document by Fiat and Cadoc called like constructions in elliptic dynamics or something. And I'll find a counterexample to my descriptive <laughs> statement there. <laughs> so for example, you can have invariant sets, you know, with like minimal dynamics and positive any positive Lebesgue measure you feel like you can have invariant sets of any Hausdorff dimension. That one's more classical. That's not really Fiat Cadoc. Um, you know, you can have examples with dense orbits, of course, uh, maybe finitely many ergodic invariant measures. It's really quite a flexible class of systems. So you need to make some restrictions. And yeah, so one, one place to start is looking at this, these like Diophantine examples with two orbits. Those should be a lot more rigid. Yeah, I think the fact when, when, when you are able then on non-contact type surface to say something with these methods and, and so on, then, then, what, then it becomes perhaps an interesting tool for our homogenic, homogeneous dynamics people, let's say, use in number theory and so on. Yeah? Because <laughs> when you have excluded, when you look at systems which have certain properties described by uh, arithmetic properties, and then now you have a tool which is beyond ergodic theory and so on, and it, and it connects different things in space. I mean, uh, I mean, there seems to be a shining castle somewhere. Yeah, yeah, th those are pretty cool systems. Something funny is that for these systems, often you don't have this phenomenon that you have this dense existence of proper invariant sets. Like yeah, usually, but, but, usually your sets are either the entire thing or they're constant. No, but that's right. But but, <laughs> but that this entire thing is that certain degenerations which you yeah. can't you, locally don't happen because you can't you have still bounds for the energy local increases or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, you know this stuff with Joel came out of the fact. That we that we realize that the 
that uh, Zarnock and company study in their business uh, certain systems which are actually Hamiltonian. And, and whatever you can say about them or what they can say about them with their methods uh, creates uh, number theoretic content. And then this systems you could actually appro approximate by, I think even by contact or something, but, but then, like the then you pass to the limit and you don't know anything. You know? Yeah. So, that, so there had to be either they, they ask uh, strange questions uh, in number theory, <laughs> uh, or, or we missed a theory. Yeah, that was obviously we missed something. So, yeah. are you are you referring to like how the Horace cycle flow can be written as a magnetic flow? Things like this. Yeah, yeah. So I think one could start saying something oh. about this kind of things. Hmm? Yeah. Okay, and then, then one has to do certain things. Uh, for I think what they're mostly interested in is. Uh, quotients with finite uh, volume, but not compact. Mm -hmm. And then they have a lot of cusps. You have a lot of uh, periodic orbits in these things and so on. This, are, this, this kind of whole cycle flow, not the, the, not the co-compact case, but the finite yeah. co case. The, the, there seems to be a lot of interest in dynamics. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think we're getting definitely closer. Can I, can I ask a question also? Um, how how about the converse? I mean, is there any hope if I give you a close, you know, proper invariant subset, can I produce a holomorphic curve, furl curve with that thing as a limit set? So, yeah, I guess, I guess the point of this lecture was to, you know, abandon extracting limiting curves entirely or something. And working with limiting sets, but um, that's uh, but as for your question, I guess I don't, I don't really know, just because I personally don't usually don't know how to make holomorphic curves go where I want them to. Yeah, or, that seems to be or avoid point. or even worse, avoid areas where I don't want them to go. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yes, but yeah. that, that one could study this. Yeah. 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 Yes. So just, just become cool. unhappy and then start. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this would tell you that you find everything, basically. <laughs> okay, so I have to go because I have to zoom with this guy. <laughs> I guess not a zoom out of that. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.